What is interesting about vestigial organs is that they teach us that during evolution living creatures didn't just acquire organs, but could also lose organs. But it isn't just because an organ is vestigial that it has had a past use which is different from the present that it has no use. Imagine a fantastic scenario in which scientists tried to rationalize our anatomy. They'd ask what use vestigial organs were. They'd surely be interested in a book published in 1893 by Robert Wiedersheim, the anatomist, who listed 86 vestiges of this sort in our body. With the advance of knowledge, the list of vestigial organs has been reduced to 10. In the desire to simplify our body, our fictional scientists could be tempted to get rid of these remains of our evolutionary past. But are they as useless as is thought? One of the most frequently cited vestigial organs is the coccyx. This body appendage to our vertebral column made up of four semi-mobile vertebrae, is 25 million years old. The coccyx can be seen as the vestige of a tail, which is welded and integrated into the anatomy of the pelvis. This tail, very useful to many species to chase away flies or to balance with, has disappeared in our line. But in the human embryo, the end of the forming vertebral column can still evoke the start of a tail. So here in this embryo, we see where the coccyx is going to form, this distal end of the vertebral column. In this earlier embryo, human embryo, we can see that it's still quite different. It is um, the extension of the neural tube. It has not yet been absorbed or resorbed back into the rest of the body. Early on, a century or more ago, People assume that this might have been a tail that was in the human, but in fact, the human never has the tail as it is known in other animals. Instead, the same bones uh, become the coccyx bones, which are at the very tail end of the vertebral column. Contrary to what is often thought, the coccyx is useful to us. It is the point of insertion for important muscles, like the gluteus maximus, and this is determinant for an upright posture. When we are seated, the coccyx also forms a support with the rest of the bones of the pelvis and helps with our balance. Another vestigial organ has often raised questions as to its use, the appendix. The case of the appendix seems to have been decided. It was thought that this little cylindrical tube which prolongs our large intestine was only a trick of evolution. Too hasty a conclusion, judge three researchers, who have led an unusual study on this little organ with a doubtful reputation. The appendix has been a, a structure of intrigue for a very long time. So a lot of people will know somebody who's had an appendix removed. Um, appendectomies are one of the most common surgeries that are performed today. And something like 6% of the population will get appendicitis at some point in their life. So this begs the question, why do we have an appendix at all? 
To answer this question, you have to start by trying to reconstitute its history in the evolution of species. When did the appendix appear, and in which animals? These are questions asked by Michel Laurin, a paleontologist. The appendix doesn't fossilize, so we only have indirect traces of its appearance like the distribution of the appendix in existing species. The most ancient appearance we found so far is in the monotremes, egg-laying mammals, spiny anteaters and platypus, which live in Australia. As both groups have an appendix, we think their common ancestor had one too, and lived at least 65 million years ago. So our appendix has a very respectable age. Heather Smith has studied the intestinal anatomy of many species. My team has been interested in trying to understand how the appendix first evolved, which species have it, and why it might be more common in some species than others. Heather has listed the size, the shape, or the position of the appendix in many animals. The research of Heather Smith has enabled the making of a classification, which is new, between species which possess an appendix and those which do not have one. Then, in partnership with Michel Laurin, this classification was combined with anatomical, environmental, and behavioral characteristics. Our study incorporates over 500 species and more than 40 characteristics. These are anatomical, such as presence or size of the appendix, and ecological, such as way of life, diurnal or nocturnal, group size, diet, herbivore or carnivore. And we've tried to establish the relationship between the presence or size of the appendix and these. The results have been synthesized into a genealogical tree of species, which allows the evolutionary history of the appendix to be traced. The apparently chance appearance of the appendix, only in certain species, raises the question of what advantage did it offer? We found that across time, the appendix has appeared more than 30 different times. Therefore, it must have some adaptive function. Traits don't just reappear unless they have some sort of adaptive function. No ecological or behavioral justification has been found. The hypothesis of a link to diet is not confirmed. The answer may be elsewhere. One man surely has the key to this enigma. His research leads us into the depths of our intestines, of which he is a specialist. For over 10 years, William Parker has been studying the useful bacteria which line our digestive tube and do us much service. Sometimes they clump together in very dense colonies called biofilm. Our gut bacteria have a very, very hard time forming a biofilm. They just can't do it. Unless you add some immune molecules that are produced in high abundance by our immune system, and then that allows the bacteria, it helps the bacteria to form a biofilm. The connection between those bacteria and the immune system is the key to understanding the puzzle of the appendix. Studying the concentration of biofilm at different points in our intestines, he realized that it increased approaching the appendix and was at its maximum level inside of it. If you look in the appendix, the biofilms there look like a very thick coat of paint. William Parker's research shows that the appendix is a factory making useful bacteria and plays a key role in our immunity. 
but paradoxically, the appendix is even more useful to us in this age of antibiotics. Today, we use a lot of antibiotics, and antibiotics are very good at destroying our beneficial bacteria. Clinicians then ask the question, if we're missing our appendix, do we have a harder time recovering from the use of antibiotics? And unfortunately, the answer is yes, we do. Perhaps it's time to take the appendix off the list of vestigial organs. These organs are not as pointless as was long time thought. They're part of our history. <laughs>